On Thursday, June 10, 2021, Ballot Hispanico presented the Instituto Choreografico. This organization provides a voice for Latinx artists. As well, it gives audiences access to the dance making process. Viewers attended this virtual performance via YouTube, Facebook, and BalletHispanico.org. Instituto Choreografico featured work in progress choreographed by Mary Ellis Garcia. We are joined today by Mary Ellis Garcia. Mary Ellis is a Dominican American dance artist, choreographer, and educator. She has a Master of Fine Arts in Digital and Interdisciplinary Art Practice, and she is currently a dance artist in residence at the University of Maryland School of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies. Tell us a little bit more about your background in dance. Oh, sure. Um, I am a classically trained, and when I say classical, um, I mean ballet. I started uh, taking dance classes um, with a former principal dancer for Dance Theater of Harlem. Um, and so from there, I really fell in love with the structure of ballet, the sort of physical acuity of it, um, but then also the sort of elegance and presence of it. Um, and the, but over the years, right, then I, I've sort of branched out and I trained uh, in, in Horton with the Ailey School. Um, I trained in Limon um, with the amazing Risa Steinberg and the whole Jose Limon history. Um, so those are the classical modern dance forms. Um, that I've done, but then also I've branched out even further um, into uh, sort of the postmodern uh, worlds of Judson Dance Theater and score making, and um, and when I say score making, sort of improvisational tasks as performance. Um, so that's sort of a, a broad uh, encapsulation of all the dancing that I've been training in. Now you mentioned a few different studios that uh, you've trained with and that you've worked with. How did you get into dancing? Yeah, uh, great question. And so studios is an interesting use of word because it's it's like these are like foundations or, or techniques um, rather than like studio like the way we think about like a a studio setting. But how did I get into? Uh, and I, I make that point to clarify because I actually got into dancing in a dance studio. Um, I went to an after school program in the public schools in Teaneck, New Jersey, where I uh, grew up the second half of my uh, youngness. Um, I was born and raised in New York, and then in middle school moved to New Jersey. Um, and there was an after school program uh, that allowed us to sort of branch out and do multiple things. And you could always sign up for the activities. And so one time uh, there was the opportunity to take dance classes um, at a local ballet studio, again, uh, with principal dancer, uh, Dance Studio of Harlem. And I was charmed. I, I took this one class and the studio owner um, was like, hey, you have some talent. And me being a very like spicy 13 year old was like, well, I know this is a way for you to make money because you're recruiting people. My parents can't afford classes, so what can I do? And from there, I started um, uh, bartering. So I would clean the studio in exchange for dance classes, and that was wow. at a local studio. Yeah, so that's, that that's some hard work and dedication. You really worked for it. I'm so into it, it was like uh, an instant love. Like, oh, I want more of this. It's almost like an obsession. It's not just that you're dancing in the studio, you're you're doing everything, you know, seeing every aspect, probably seeing uh, different dancers throughout the time that you're there, just picking up on their techniques from such an early age. 
Yeah, and especially, I mean, I started dancing when I was 13, so um, it felt like I was behind, right? At, what does that mean? Like being 13 years old and starting dancing is not behind, but I was looking at the older kids and the younger kids and like trying to get all the information as possible. So you're absolutely right. There was a, a, a sort of unconscious, like absorbing that was happening. What inspires you to dance? You know, it's, that's an interesting question. I'm a, I think I'm a kinesthetic learner. Um, I'm, I, I like touching things. I like sweating. I like um, the way things feel on my skin. Like, uh, and so dance sort of feels um, both difficult, but also sort of uh, homey in a, in a weird kind of way. Like my, a, a form of communication that feels beyond just like verbal. What do you want your viewers or audiences to take away from your performances? Oh man, um, yeah, their own kinesthetic being, I think, is is the most exciting. If I if I can get audiences to um, connect to their own bodies in some way, um, that always feels in in some ways how uh, like exciting to me. My my pieces, I'm trying to create. I created this role. Uh, action within myself when I'm performing or maybe when I'm making a piece on someone else um, and then if audiences sort of get enthralled and um, aware of like the the physicality of it the the excitement in their own bodies um, then I feel like I'm transcending the art form what piece of advice would you give to your 13 year old self if you could go all the way back if you could meet your 13 year old self what would you tell her um, yeah, that's a good question. Stick with it. Uh, the, the road is not linear and yeah, do it your way. It's cool. <laughs> like stick with it. <laughs> so I'm not sure if you have any nieces or nephews or, um, if children at all in your life, but do you think that you would, you would teach them ballet? and you would teach them how to dance and all, the, all those foundations that are so prevalent in your life. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I think dance beyond making it a profession, uh, any physical practice um, is so important. I have a, um, I'm currently a dance artist in residence at the University of Maryland. Um, and so I have, uh, teaching has always been part of my practice, but in the past year, it really has sort of come forward. Um, and I think there is something to be gained about the practice of dance, like the learning of um, like the self-discipline, the uh, like awareness of your own physicality and space. All those things transcend uh, even just having dance as a career. Um, it transcends the way you move through the world. And so I don't, um, yeah, I would, I would definitely, I do think that teaching is a part of my practice, but I would definitely recommend uh, some kind of physical practice and dance. I always come back to it because it's my fave, but um, physical practices are so important. Yeah. You describe yourself as a dance artist. Can you tell us about what it is to be that, in that role, what that role means to you? Yeah, m using movement as a form of art making. So movement of the body and movement of multiple bodies. Um, and it's weird sometimes when I say the body as if I'm separating it from the people that we are. Um, uh, so dance artist to me is using people, bodies and movement um, as a form of art making. Has the pandemic changed the way in which you express your creativity in dance? If so, in which ways? Yeah, so the, the for a long time I've been, I was a freelance dancer in New York City. Um, and the last year has really sort of completely sabotaged our, our yes. well-being. Um, nope, there's no live performances, obviously, as everyone is experiencing or, or very limited live performances. And so when that's your livelihood, you know, working with multiple dance companies um, and then doing working up to performances, um, it can feel like you're lost um, at in this point. Um, but yeah. 
right before the pandemic started, I was pursuing my MFA in digital and interdisciplinary art practice. Um, so in the last year, I both finished that MFA program um, and leaned heavily into a digital practice. So um, I've had a handful of performances uh, via uh, the virtual, <laughs> um, via the digital. Um, and so that is something that I was already curious about, but it feels like the pandemic has made it um, all that more prevalent. So I'm like really leaning into virtual performances. Well, at least for with the pandemic, it gives you the opportunity to really hone in on those skills um, that maybe, of, of course, you're such an amazing dancer. That's why I'm interviewing you. But um, maybe some things that you've always wanted to try and maybe didn't have as much extra time. So do you feel like right. you're, you're ex doing more experimentation? Yeah, for sure. This this last spring, um, I created a, a piece called uh, Interfacing. And in this piece, I had a friend who was uh, in Brooklyn and I was in my Harlem apartment and I was using a Kinect camera. Um, and it was a live virtual performance uh, with the Austin Art Center, actually, of Trinity College in, in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, and in this piece, you know, I was using this camera that is heat censored and um, wow. <laughs> My friend was like controlling my computer from Brooklyn while I was dancing. Um, and so the you can sort of see the room change and I'm dancing with myself. There's like these graphics. It's um, but it was all live. Um, that would have I maybe would have gotten there eventually. Um, but it feels like that kind of experimentation really I was I had the time and the and the resources to be able to lean into that kind of experimentation. So you're absolutely right. The the, the certain circumstances that the current circumstances that we're in um, have definitely allowed for a different avenue of research. What has been your favorite project to work on thus far? Oh man. <laughs> there, there's probably so, so many, it's so hard to choose, but. So hard to choose. I worked for a really long time uh, with a choreographer named Brian Brooks. Um, some of his works really felt um, like I was learning about myself while also sort of helping him create something that feels fully his vision. Um, so those projects were always super fun. I work with a um, visual artist named Madeline Hollander um, and her projects are always amazing. She currently has a work up at the Whitney Museum in New York City. Um, uh, what else? This current project that I did with Ballet Hispanico, a totally different role, right? I'm creating a work on uh, some of the most proficient and acute dancers I've ever had the chance to work with. And um, I'm in a role of a choreographer, so sort of leaning into what I'm imagining and then being able to sort of uh, place that on, on a group of amazing dancers. That was an incredible project. So many, yeah, it's been, yeah. How does your identity in the New Yorker and Dominican American artists influence your art? Yeah, um, it always feels like I exist in the liminal, and I think a lot of people feel this way. Um, being Dominican American, I, I, yeah, I, my parents are immigrants, and so there is a real cultural um, specificity to their experience as as now Americans. Um, but then me being born in America, that has a certain cultural ex experience and, and wanting to fit in of some sort. And yet also then I'm a dancer. And so, so many people are like, what is that career? Um, so I, I feel like this, these overlapping, it's almost like the Venn diagram circles. Um, I have all these circles that sort of exist and I'm, I'm sort of in that tiny space where all the circles overlap um, and 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 I'm happy to sort of like sit in that place now right after I'm I'm finding um, comfort in that sort of liminal liminalness um, and knowing that that my voice has value or, or you know trusting that my voice has value You've mentioned that within concert dance, there aren't many female Dominican-American choreographers. How important is it 
uh, to you that we see more representation of Dominican American female choreographers. Yeah, thanks for bringing this up. There's um, a few, but not many. And in concert dance, well, um, I think we've been realizing that in concert dance, um, there's a lot of male choreographers in general. And so I think um, just the the female choreographer, uh, like there's so many female choreographers, Madeline one, um, uh, Francesca Harper, I'm thinking of, um, Annabella Lopez, uh, like so many um, amazing artists, and uh, you know, in some ways, right? Like I'm, I'm Dominican American, and I'm, I'm trusting that. Um, but really, I just want to sort of see more female choreographers on the on the docket for major name uh, companies. How can we better ensure that more Latinx female artists are part of the concert dance conversation? How can we ensure that? I think this kind of programming that Ballet Hispanico has in, in terms of the Instituto Coreografico, um, being able to support uh, up and coming and emerging artists in the field, um, specifically through the Latinx lens um, is, is one way um, and this kind of programming where you're interviewing and, and sharing the name um, yeah we're I think we're on the right track can you tell us more about Instituto Choreografico Choreografico yeah Instituto Choreografico is a program hosted by uh, Ballet Hispanico located on the Upper West Side of New York City um, and what they do is they basically support um, and they pay a emerging choreographer uh, for two weeks to create on the company. And so you get a company of dancers for two weeks to create something. Um, you also get a mentor um, as part of the program and there's a rehearsal director in the room um, that knows the dancers. So all these elements as a independent choreographer, right, that would be a lot of fundraising for eight dancers, a rehearsal director, a mentor for the piece, and then paying myself along with all these other bodies in the room or people in the room. Um, and so this kind of resource is it just huge. Um, it gives you the opportunity to sort of experiment in ways that um, you might not always have the, uh, the resources or the support for. Um, and one of the things that I really enjoyed about this program is that throughout the, you know, leading up to the two weeks, it was always um, said that, uh, I didn't have to make a piece. It was about the process, just being in the room and um, seeing what comes through. Of course, uh, it was a luxury and it felt like, <laughs> uh, yeah, so much fun. So of course I ended up making something that I'm, I'm really proud of and that's a testament to um, the company of Ballet Hispanico. They're, they're an uh, amazing group of humans. Can you tell me more about this performance? I know you're going to go very soon. And um, yeah. tell, tell me more about this performance. Yeah, so um, the, the work that we ended up creating, I titled Temporal. Um, and the interesting thing about uh, that word is that Temporal um, uh, translates and is spelled uh, to temporal in English. It's spelled the same way um, and has similar definitions in that uh, they have to do with time. Uh, so um, in this piece, we're looking at the virtuosity of um, a consistency of time. Um, but then that sort of helps us connect to our, ourselves in a, in a bigger way. Yeah. Um, so rhythm and movement are a big part of the piece. Um, so that's what we'll be talking about in <laughs> the next show I'm running to. Do you have any... Well, just like you said, the next show that you're running, do you have any more upcoming performances or projects that your viewers can look out for? Yeah, so this uh, showing tonight is at Ballet Hispanico's website. Um, there's also a YouTube link, I think. Um, so that's happening where we're doing a live showing. The piece will be shown um, at the um, Little Island Festival this summer. Um, I am personally choreographing a new work I've been uh, given a grant by the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council to create a new virtual work. So sort of um, 
leaning in a little bit on this piece that I just talked about interfacing that has to do with like a virtual performance, but uh, not just one body, but multiple bodies performing together through a virtual uh, context in multiple places. Um, so that'll happen this fall. Um, and then in February of 22, I'm creating a sort of dance theater piece um, for uh, the University of Maryland, and it's currently called Un Espectro Real. So uh, it's going to be sort of a, a live theater piece on the uh, sort of joy and um, like exuberance of <laughs> coming out of the last year. Um, so that'll be a fun wow. one too. How are you picking your themes? Because I know you're, you're mentioning for this performance, it's about time, uh, and then you listed a few different a few different themes. How are you coming up with these themes? Is anything like influencing it, like the pandemic, or different things in your life? Yeah, so um, time, you know, the time piece I think is, the temporal is, is directly related to, in some ways, um, being unable to hold time, right? The temporal plane is the things that are right here and now um, and are not eternal, and yet time feels like it's forever moving, and so um, it feels like a way of trying to hold time. Um, and and I think they're all connected, right? The the virtual piece um, also came out of <laughs> the last year um, trying to figure out how to perform in COVID. Uh, and so how do I do that with multiple bodies? Um, so it's sort of multi-plane world. Um, and then and then Un Espectro Real is really looking at joy and so in some ways also a uh, consistent in it, um, like the evolving or the coming through something or the um, moving into something new. Uh, so they're all sort of related and yet not quite specific. <laughs> wow, I, I cannot wait to watch this performance and all your future performances. I'm so excited. I know you have to run. Oh, yeah. You have to go on stage in mere, mere minutes. <laughs> so I'll let you go. <laughs> it has been a pleasure talking to you, Mary Ellis. Thank you for watching Inbox with Julia Cosby on Tag TV. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on the bell notifications to stay up to date on our latest videos.